If thorium's so great, why haven't we used it before? Is there a better and safer way to tap nuclear fission? And if so, how close are we to achieving our clean energy future? Today we get the answer. I'm Sean Kenny, and this is Rock Logic. Everybody and welcome to part two of the Rock Logic Thorium episode. Last time we discussed thorium as the revolutionary new fuel that will unlock our vast untapped potential. Today we're going to talk about the machine that will actually allow us to do that. Now the fact is, a raw material is not a natural resource until we develop technology to use it. Coal was not a resource until we developed steam engines. Petroleum wasn't a resource until we developed uh, gasoline to run on internal combustion engines, and uranium wasn't a resource until we developed the light water reactor, which I'm going to discuss in this episode. We can use thorium in several different reactors, but based off of decades of government and privately funded research, the general consensus is that the molten salt reactor is the best reactor in that case. And though it is worth mentioning that the initial molten salt reactor experiment did not use thorium in its initial configuration, it was intended to be used as such by the gentleman at Oak Ridge because of its unique properties. But why is that the case and how different is it from what we're currently using today? I'm gonna to go into a little bit of a brief history as well as some insight in terms of how the current nuclear industry operates. So right now, as we stand today, there are several hundred reactors operating around the world that are referred to as light water reactors. We have about 95 of them uh, here in the United States that currently make up about 19.7% of the electricity that we generate, or to put it in a better context, most of the clean zero carbon energy that we produce. It's pretty extraordinary. Now, the light water reactor was invented by Alvin Weinberg, who coincidentally was the same gentleman who invented the molten salt reactor, and the program was initiated in the 1950s by a U.S. Navy Admiral by the name of Hyman Rickover, who envisioned a future in where the United States Navy would have a fleet of nuclear-powered submarines that would be operating below the surface for weeks or months at a time without ever having to resurface or refuel. Uh, they could operate in the Arctic Circle, and if they were ever engaged in some sort of confrontation with the Soviets, that they'd be able to do so within a moment's notice. Obviously, this had a tremendous amount of benefits for the U.S. Navy, and this cultivated into the development of the USS Nautilus, the first nuclear-powered submarine. Uh, as far as the U.S. Army was concerned, they had their own program, which is Project Iceworm. Uh, this cultivated into the development of Camp Century, which was an underground facility that was powered by a single modular light water reactor uh, that operated from 1959 to 1967. Uh, the base had a, a staff of dozens of uh, U.S. military personnel operating on a rotational basis. Uh, in the civilian markets, a lot of the inventors and the developers of the light water reactor wanted to see if this could be uh, uh, attributed to uh, atoms for peace for civilian use. Uh, this led to the development of the shipping port reactor in Pennsylvania, which operated for 32 years on a combination of both thorium and uranium. So to discuss how it works, it's pretty simple. You have solid fuel and liquid moderator as well as water for cooling. The solid fuel rods run on uranium-235 that's been lightly enriched. The solid fuel control rods uh, create fission. They heat water to make steam. The steam generates a turbine, generates electricity. Though the reactor was optimized for the needs of the Navy, it wasn't particularly optimized for that of civilian use. There were a lot of drawbacks. Uh, for starters, the reactor has to operate under high pressures and low temperatures. Anyone who's taken a high school chemistry class probably knows that water boils at 100 degrees C or 212 degrees Fahrenheit. That's not particularly hot enough to run a Racklin cycle steam turbine uh, to generate electricity. So to compensate for this, a nuclear reactor has to be put under a tremendous amount of pressure to get the water at much higher temperatures. This solves the problem from a thermodynamics perspective, however, it leads to some other problems. One of the biggest things that a nuclear reactor operator has to account for is something referred to as a double-ended pipe break. In the event that there's been a, a complete loss of pressure or a crack in the reactor or anything like that, and pressurized steam uh, automatically just goes into the reactor vessel, this could lead into some problems, maybe even explosion like we saw with Fukushima Daiichi. So to compensate for this, 
the reactor has to be surrounded and encased in a nine inch thick steel pressure vessel, which in turn is surrounded by another layer of steel reinforced concrete. This of course leads us to a problem in regards to construction delays and cost overruns because of the materials and the forgings that you have to go through in order to get those materials. Uh, if this wasn't bad enough, there's also an efficiency issue in regards to the light water reactor. The fact is solid fuels are not particularly that great. You can mix a liquid, you can mix a gas. You cannot mix a solid unless you convert it into a liquid and a gas. And with solid fuels, your best case scenario, at least with what today's reactors can do, is you can consume about one and a half percent, or I'm sorry, one half of one percent of the fuel in the reactor before the rest of it gets contaminated and has to be thrown away as waste. So not particularly great, uh, and it also has to be constantly uh, put under back, backup power to prevent any sort of a meltdown. So you're probably thinking, well, this sounds horrible. Why in God's name are we using this? And if there were better, more functional reactors being developed at that time, why didn't we use those instead? Well, there were several reasons for that. For starters, the U.S. government put a lot of money uh, behind the light water reactor because uh, of what the Navy needed at the time. And the private companies that were developing the reactor technology uh, obviously benefited from it greatly because the U.S. Navy was able to uh, or willing to put up the first mover costs to get that reactor into circulation. And of course, you know, those companies, they already had the patents, the research, the R&D, all paid for by the taxpayer. It made every other competing technology uncompetitive. Uh, even though it's less than 1% efficient in terms of its fuel consumption, that less than 1% um, still generates more power and less waste than uh, comparable means, say coal or gas or oil. The reason for this is that splitting an atom is always going to be a million times more energy efficient than that of a carbon hydrogen bond. Uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission... Uh, I don't want to give them too much flack because they are, in fact, the gold standard of operating and regulating safe reactors in this country. Everything that they do, unfortunately, is attributed to how do you make a light water reactor? And if you develop a better reactor that operates on different principles, doesn't use water for cooling, doesn't use solid fuel, doesn't have these particular safety systems, you don't get a license to even develop a prototype for that reactor in this country. And uh, on top of that, we had a bunch of environmental anti-nuke protests that were occurring in the 1970s and 80s which, of course, created a lot of uh, pressure on politicians to cur uh, curb or cut back funding for advanced reactor developments and further developments of the light water reactor uh, into this country. So we've gone into the light water reactor. We've talked about its advantages and shortcomings. Uh, how does the molten salt reactor compare? Uh, well, it operates very differently. For starters, it runs on low pressures, uh, so you don't need that big pressure vessel. You can make the reactor much smaller as a result of that, much safer. It operates at high temperatures, considerably much higher temperatures than that of the light uh, water reactor. Uh, you can run a steam turbine, but because of the high temperatures, you actually can go even further. You can actually go in and externally heat something like supercritical CO2 to run a Brayton cycle gas turbine. Now, the comparison between the two is the Brayton cycle is, of course, much smaller and much more efficient. A 300 megawatt turbine that would power a city like the one that I live in uh, takes up the size of a small uh, small building, whereas a Brayton cycle turbine will literally take up the size of the desk that I'm currently looking at right now and generate the same amount of electricity using far less space, a lot less environmental impact, very efficient design. Uh, it's 100% meltdown proof because it's the fuel's already melted. You actually have to keep it in a melted state in order to keep the reactor going, and if it ever stops, the fuel just solidifies. As a further uh, engineered safety uh, uh, feature of the reactor, the guys at Oak Ridge envisioned uh, a reactor would use a freeze plug that would operate under the bottom of the reactor. If there was ever a critical moment where there was a loss of power and you just couldn't get power to the reactor for whatever reason, that freeze plug would melt, the fuel salts would drain out of the reactor vessel into drain tanks and where fission would just stop happening and you wouldn't have any sort of contamination breach or anything that would lead to any harm to the general public. Um, in a burner reactor, uh, you actually can achieve 99% fuel burnup by comparison to the less than 1% you could do with a light water reactor. This is extremely uh, waste efficient in the sense that, you know, 
you could take up a football field with the amount of nuclear fuel that you've generated in this country. By comparison, the amount of fuel that you would generate to uh, power a city like Boston and the fuel waste that would be made as a result of that would be about a coffee can in comparison. And to uh, to further you know prove that point, that fuel that's left over that can't be used for anything only stays radioactive for about three centuries by comparison to uranium, which could stay radioactive for about 10,000 years. Uh, so that's basically uh, the molten salt reactor. As you can see, it's a far more efficient design than uh, anything that we've produced, and that includes the light water reactor. So where do we stand on this? Where does the industry, where is the world as far as molten salt reactors go? Well, there are several countries around the world and abroad that are looking at thorium as an energy source, uh, particularly China, which has actually gone uh, full ham and in investing into molten salt technologies. Uh, ever since 2011, they spent hundreds of millions of dollars uh, at the U uh, Chinese Academy of Scientists. Uh, they have about three to 400 scientists working full time. They're working on both a molten salt cooled and a molten salt fueled reactor. A uh, prototype might see fruition sometime within the next five to six years. Uh, hopefully a commercial reactor, probably sometime in the next decade in the 2030s or maybe before 2040. So really exciting stuff. Uh, here in the U.S., the Trump administration uh, passed the Nuclear Energy uh, Innovation Capabilities Act, which uh, basically cuts a lot of the red tape and regulatory burdens associated with getting prototype reactors licensed in this country. And uh, there's a further emphasis in the Department of Energy and National Labs to work with private industry to develop said reactors. But the really exciting stuff is coming from the private sector. Now, there are literally dozens of companies that I could list off the top of my head that are doing some really cool things, but the two companies I really wanna focus on are the ones I feel have the most promise. One is a company called Thorcon Power. They're based in Florida, but they're currently working with the Indonesian government because Indonesia has expressed interest in this particular technology, and they are working towards writing the regulatory code and framework to license molten salt reactors in their country. The reason for such is, you know, Indonesia, like many countries in the uh, in the world, uh, have a growing need for electricity demand. Unfortunately, uh, they will only go with the cheapest means available to them, which is coal fired power. What Thorcon is doing is they're taking the same research and data developed by the good people at the Oak Ridge National Lab in the 1960s. And what they're doing is they're incorporating modern shipbuilding techniques to mass produce these reactors and power plants uh, in a much cheaper, much more efficient uh, cycle. They're basically going for greenfield deployments. And the benefit to that is if they're already considering building a power plant in a particular place in Indonesia, the market case they can make is, hey, don't buy this dirty coal fire power plant that's gonna cause you all kinds of headaches down the road. Buy my nuclear plant, which is gonna be cheaper than coal. It's gonna be cheaper from an operating standpoint. It's gonna be safer and it's gonna be far more environmentally benign because there's less weight, uh, waste and zero emissions as a result of that. So they've got a pretty solid business case and they'll have a prototype up and running probably within the next five years. Really looking forward to talking more about them in this podcast. Now, I will mention that that it would be a single fluid burner design. The difference is, is that a burner burns up most of the fissile material in the reactor. And that's pretty much every reactor that's ever been built. But the really exciting reactor would be the lifter, which is stands for the liquid fluoride thorium reactor that's being developed by Flybe Energy in Huntsville, Alabama. The difference between the design is that this will be a two fluid breeder reactor. Unlike the burner, which burns most of the fissile material on the reactor, a breeder reactor will actually produce more fissile material than what's actually being consumed. Uh, the benefits of this reactor is that it has its own on-site chemical processing, which allows them to extract the precursor material from said reactors and the fuel salt. This will allow them to extract th medical isotopes, things like molybdenum 99 and bismuth 213, which will allow them to basically go in and uh, use them for various medical procedures and possibly cancer treatments. Uh, pretty exciting stuff. Uh, as of right now, uh, they currently have uh, a combination of private and publicly funded grant money from the Department of Energy, and they're working with the Pacific Northwest National Labs in terms of doing some chemical research and further validating their work.
So uh, that's the conclusion of today's episode. So now we've talked about thorium and how great of an energy source that is. And we've talked about the molten salt reactor, which is the best machine that we can implement with this great uh, uh, abundant resource. Uh, next episode, we're going to discuss how you take those two things together and what kind of industrial applications you can apply when you have a world with cheap and abundant energy. But that'll be on the next episode. For now, I'm Sean Kenny, and this is Rock Logic.